tell me more about what does it mean, the Russian-Ukraine crisis for the world food security? The first is that the prices were already very high. In the February 2022, the FAO food price index reached a new historical record, 21% above its level a year earlier and 2.2% higher than its previous peak in February 2011, which is the highest we had in history. Now, in nominal terms, in real terms, still we are not in February 2011 levels, but it extre was extremely high. Now, wheat exports by Russian Federation and Ukraine account for about 30% of the global market combine some flour oil exports represent 55%. And they also have a significant share in fertilizers. So for fertilizers, 25 countries rely on Russian Federation with an import dependency of 30% or more for the N, P, and K fertilizers. Russia plays a significant role in the fertilizer market in the world that put also pressure on fertilizers, which were already high, historically high because of the high prices of energy. And that also puts at risk our future harvest. But as things go on by the end of this month, what can we expect? If that is the case and the, and the conflict doesn't continue more than March, then of course uh, the markets will stabilize and things will go back to normal. But if the conflict continues further and it affects the end of the harvest, so it goes up to May or end of April, then we cannot only be affecting these 7 million metric tons of wheat and 11 million metric tons of maize, but also we will put at risk the next harvest season, and that will be extremely risky. In addition, Russia announced uh, two days ago uh, a ban on exports of cereals and of fertilizers, which also puts more pressure in the market. So today, what we are observing is that prices already capture this gap that I was referring before, and that's why they increase very quickly at the end yeah. of the month and the beginning of the month. Now they are settling a little bit, but the new export restriction of Russia could put more pressure and they could start going up uh, again. But the major risk, as I said before, is the potential risk of the next harvest. That, that's where things could get extremely serious. Are there substitutes? Are they enough for this? What about next year? Oh, next year, the situation is different, no? Because next year, what it will imply is that we have to recover 30% of the share on the world of the exported uh, cereals. And that is very complex to recover because in addition uh, to being need to cover this huge gap that will be if we assume that Russia and uh, Ukraine doesn't produce for next year, we have the problem of fertilizers, which already is affecting the next harvest of key exporting countries like Brazil, Argentina. Mm -hmm. They are very concerned about of access to fertilizers in the US. So it would be very complex to cover that gap of 30%. The gap of, of right now on the short term, we can cover a significant part of it, but the gap of next year, it will be close to not possible in our projections uh, at this point because of these two elements. No? The, the gap, of course, the, the shrinking supply on 30% of cereals, but also because of the increasing prices of fertilizers, which are supposed to continue to increase this because of the energy prices, although we have seen in the last three days that uh, oil prices went down to 100, but that's more or less where they will stay. If you look at what we are going through right now, many people will say, I will not suffer from hunger, but there are already tens of millions of people that are on the verge of hunger, if I understand right, in different parts of the world. So what would that mean to them, Maximo? Now, regarding mm -hmm. hunger, so COVID-19 put us in a very tough situation. No? There was an increase in 161 million people more chronically and they're nourished last year because of COVID-19. That puts us on over 800 million people chronically undernourished. Now, in our simulations, uh, assuming different scenarios right now, so if we assume uh, an scenario where we only lose this year 10 million metric tons of cereals, then what we are expecting is an increase in prices between 8%, depending on the crop, up to uh, uh, a severe scenario where we could go up to 20% more or less. So wheat prices going up to 8.7%, maize 8.2%, uh, some flour or coarse grains 9.6% in a, in a moderate scenario, but in a severe scenario, they, all of them can go up to 20%, relative to a baseline, which was already increasing, okay? So this is not the absolute level, it's respect to a baseline that was already in a positive because the prices were already increasing. So the, 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 the potential increase is significant this year. And if this happens this year in, in the moderate scenario even, 
In the moderate scenario, we were looking at around 7.6 million people more uh, chronically undernourished. And in the case of the, of the severe scenario, up to 13.1 million people more in 2022. This is only because of the conflict, okay? If the situation continues and affects the harvest of next year, then the numbers could be significantly higher. There is a huge difference about the capacity and the ability to deal with vulnerability between the developed economies and the developing ones, particularly the least developed economies. So how is FAO and the UN system working together to address these vulnerabilities? The challenge we are facing now is that poorest countries are the most import-dependent countries, okay? And those countries, almost all of them, have serious debt ratios, which are extremely high, serious levels of debt. And for them, it's extremely difficult to cover and to import the food that they need under the current price situation. So we need to find a way in which we can help these countries and, and we can help them to use as more efficient as possible the limited resources they have. The first thing that, that, that we are doing in the very, very short term is to focus in the 15 countries which were importing more than 50% from Ukraine and Russia of the cereals crops so that we can help them to diversify their supplies, like Egypt, uh, like Indonesia, like Bangladesh, for example. The idea is to advise them with the correct information so that they don't go out and buy when the prices are too high because of the noise in the market. So if one of these countries came out and bought commodities immediately when the conflict started to expand, then they will have lost a lot of money because the prices are a little bit lower now. So we have to provide as much information as possible for them to make the good decisions and to help them to diversify where they procure uh, their commodities. In the short term, not in the middle, but in the short term, we need to look also uh, at which are the countries which are in food crisis situation and how we can help them through our emergency support, how we can help them by supporting the provision on the most vulnerable areas of those countries of at least seeds and inputs so that they can produce something that will assure them their return. So one dollar invested in, 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 in input supplies could basically help to be equivalent to a return of around 20 to 30 dollars. So it's significantly different to just providing cash transfers to them. So that's what we need to do in the food crisis countries, which will be the most vulnerable. Then we need to assure and work on bringing information in the short term also to keep trade flowing. Because if any country, which is a key exporting country, start to put export restrictions, then that could exacerbate the situation even more, and then it will be moving into a situation of a food crisis. And that's what we need to do. Against the certain countries and therefore- No, sanctions, sanctions, sanctions are different. Export restrictions is that a key exporting country stop to export their Syria. Sanctions are measures that are put against Russia in this case because of the war. And those could affect also transactions, uh, but those are different to export restrictions. Export restrictions is when a country makes a decision not to export their commodity, as Russia has done on fertilizers and on cereals. So that is what we need to avoid around the world, because then, if not, we will have a bigger supply shock of the commodity that move across, across borders. How much of the export control will have an impact on the export? How much of sanctions will have an impact on the export of foods? Sanctions are not touching food at this point, uh, uh, but they are touching financial transactions, and that, of course, can affect any trading transaction on food. So that's something to look at carefully. In terms of fertilizers, the, the sanctions are not on fertilizer. The, the, the exporter is Russia. So basically, the, the goal here is if Russia can export fertilizers to the world, then fertilizers will move. But that Russia has decided to restrict exports to the world of fertilizers, which puts more pressure on the fertilizer issue. The other sanctions, which are related to inputs, like seeds and pesticides, which are mostly coming from Europe, to Russia, that will also affect the next planting season. Let me remind you of the year 2008, the financial crisis. At that time, inflation around the world, particularly the impact on the developing countries uh, with the printing of money in some countries. Now, how do you see what we have today? These boosting prices, uh, of course, create a problem to developing countries 
because uh, they will demand more uh, and these countries will have to produce more to deliver. And that has created also inflation in developing countries. Uh, and in addition to that, devaluations. No? The dollar is getting stronger, the local currency is getting weaker. And as a result of that, any imports are more expensive for the poorest countries, in addition to the problems that we have discussed before. So the financial situation for these countries, which are already, and they were already because of COVID-19, extremely in-depth, uh, is very critical because they won't have capacity uh, to be able to cope with the current situation if it continues. So it's a situation where there will be a need of sin significant financial support by the IFAs, IFIs, IMF and the World Bank and other agencies to allow to these countries to be able to continue operating properly.